you Thank you. Um, do we want to wait a couple more minutes, or what's the uh, what's the idea here? Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, as you may or may not know, I'm Tammy. I'm the Ward Four City Councilor. So thank you again. We're gonna get started, like right now because I'm mindful of your time and I do want to I want to let you all know thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for uh, for choosing to be involved so um, just some quick sorry heavy breathing I'm really sorry about that just a quick look at the agenda uh, we'll be doing a welcoming but we are so incredibly lucky to have general manager Mike Zagarek here he is the GM for uh, corporate corporate finance and corporate services. Um, and then we'll do a word for update followed by question and answer and then we'll do a closing. Uh, just so everyone knows, in terms of housekeeping, the bathrooms are through the middle lobby and on the left-hand side over here. Please help yourself to some foods because frankly, every time I gotta go home with it and um, there's a lot of food all the time. So thank you so much. All right, so I'd like to do a quick land of acknowledgement. The city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and the Sasagas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792, between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history that this land, of this land, so that we can be better, so we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. Just when you have a moment, please take a moment to really think about how this land acknowledgement and how we are on this land, just so that you can, um, how we want to uh, facilitate reconciliation with our First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and the, the keepers of this land. You may or may not know my team, so Pascal is at the back, say hi to Pascal. <laughs> say hi to Jack, Jack. So Jack and Pascal uh, are the amazing team that actually does a lot of the work for the ward. I spend a lot of time in council chambers, so you'll usually speak to Jack first, uh, and then sometimes when Pascal's able to, she'll also answer calls and emails. But please know that what they interact with, with you, they always give me an update on this, so I am fairly well aware as to what's happening in the ward. But uh, if you do want me to connect with you, it might be an 8.30 a.m. call or a 7 p.m. call, depending on how council works. So, uh, but please just let them know that you want me to get in touch with them and I'm happy to make those calls or emails back to you. So without any, uh, without any ado, I'd like to introduce to you uh, GM Mike Zagarek, and uh, we are going to be talking about the budget for today. And, also, I do know that when you registered, you did have some questions. So we'll start with question and answer inside of the room, but then we'll also go to questions that were submitted online to us. So everybody, please help welcome GM's Mike Zagarek. Yes. I think Councillor Wang was making comments to me about the number of hours we keep Council Way and get Council Chambers, including during the budget process. So, Maybe you might want to hold on. So thanks for inviting me uh, to your Ward 4 meeting. And thanks for inviting me home, because I spent the first 20 years of my life growing up in Ward 4, oh. more specifically, Reed and Central. Oh. Uh, and uh, graduate of Viscount and Churchill. 
And if you lived in Rosedale uh, 35 years ago and you went to DJ's Variety on Dundonald, I was the cashier who was <laughs> serving you at DJ's. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to be back in the neighborhood. Nice to be back home. Uh, so, so tonight there's a lot of slides, but I'm going to go through them fairly quickly to leave some room for Q&A, uh, provide a bit of a overview. Uh, and then if you have any specifics, I'll try to answer them. If there's any answers I don't have, we'll be happy to work with the counselor's office to, to document those and get answers to you. So in terms of this year's uh, tax supported budget process is uh, council asked for some changes in terms of the budget process. Previously, we had three budgets. We had a water, wastewater, storm budget we referred to as the rate budget. And that uh, typically was approved in November, December, approved this year in December. And then previously we had a tax operating budget and a tax capital budget. Council wanted those two budgets consolidated into one budget, uh, and they wanted a change in terms of the budget process, expedite it, uh, and make it a little simpler for the general public to understand municipal budgeting. So uh, we, we, back in November of this year, we had our first delegation session. Uh, we published the budget documents early this year. We had another delegation session uh, last, just over a week ago, 19th, staff provided an overview, similar to the one that you're, you're receiving tonight, but this one's a little shorter and hopefully a little uh, little more interesting specific to board work. And then boards and agencies, departmental presentations, uh, some budget discussions, and this is tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a number of motions that council is putting forward to amend the budget. Uh, and that's the budget previously presented was staff's proposed budget. I'll speak to that in a second. And then we're targeting February 15th for council's approval of the tax budget. So as I mentioned previously, one of the changes is it's one budget now an operating capital consolidated budget. Uh, as well as in August of this year, because of one of the legislative changes Premier Ford made, is mayors now have special authorities under strong mayor delegations. And Mayor Horvath provided direction to the city manager and to myself as treasurer to do as I described, which is presenting one budget. And back in the fall, uh, early, sorry, late summer, Staff presented a outlook for 2024, and we were presenting a residential tax increase of 14.2%. So the mayor, uh, as well as council, recognizing the affordability and the challenge of a 14.2% tax increase gave direction to reduce that tax increase, in part drawing from some of our uh, strengths in terms of financial management, and that is our reserves, uh, as well as gave direction to senior leadership team to go find some efficiencies and savings to reduce the tax rate. And then there's some business cases, council referred items, and I'll speak to those. Those are incremental investments that are coming forward, some investments improving services and programs. So where we currently sit is a average residential increase of 7.9%. And if you look at the, the blue part of this pie, that's 7.9 in terms of what council really has authority over of that 7.9 is and is affecting represents about 4.3% of the 7.9. 2.7%, which is the provision of city services. We provide 70 services that spans from daycare to long term. Uh, and so the 2.7 accounts for maintenance pressures, what we call maintenance pressures, could be collective bargaining pressures, inflationary pressures, uh, and that's reflected in the 2.7. Council in um, 2023 declared a opioid mental health and housing emergency. And you'll see that about 1.6% of that 7.9 is affected by council wanting to make incremental investments 
in homelessness and housing, given the crisis we're having in uh, homelessness and housing. 1% is the hospitals, Hamilton Health Sciences and St. Joseph's that put forward redevelopment plans for the next number of years. And under provincial legislation, they're required for the local community to be a funding partner in terms of their redevelopments. So for the city of Hamilton, they've asked for $462 million towards their redevelopment plans. So right now we have just a placeholder of about 1%, and 1% translates into about $12 million. Uh, so just putting that on the radar for council, that was included in the 7 point. And the other 2.6% is uh, the provincial government made some changes with respect to how municipalities pay for growth. And we pay for growth principally through development charges. And in, um, in order to affect, and, and this was the, pre, sorry, the provincial government's intent to affect the affordability of housing, They've transferred the burden of those development charges or a number of those development charges from developers to taxpayers and ratepayers. So for 2024, that represents 2.6%. So again, 7.9%, 4.3% for city services, housing, homelessness, and 3.6% really related to provincial impacts with respect to the budget. And I'll go through these fairly quickly. The council set a number of priorities for the term 2022 to 26. Those include sustainable economic ecological development, safe and thriving neighborhoods, working of city hall and tr transparency of municipal government. So the 2024 budget strives to achieve those three council priorities in the ways that are listed on this slide. So the overall gross budget. So this is all the investment that we are forecasting for 2024 in the city of Hamilton. We're forecasting about $2.4 billion that the municipality will be responsible in the delivery of services. So services representing about $2.4 billion. And this represents about 70 services that the city provides. As I mentioned earlier, spans from big care to long-term care, and in order to support this level of investment, currently we're projecting a residential tax increase at 7.9%. That would represent about 382 additional dollars for an average household assessed at 385,000. I get it, assessments vary across the city, including within Ward 4. So again, we use the city average of 385. So what are some of the the larger investments in terms of that $2.4 billion, social services, and that's childcare, long-term care, Ontario Works, they represent about 382 million. 276 million in transportation. And this is roads, bridges, sidewalks, traffic operations. And we're making some additional investments towards those assets to extend the useful life of those assets. 239 million in transit, and in transit you'll see, uh, I'm not sure if it's in the slides I have tonight, but count what's before council is uh, year seven and eight of our 10-year transit strategy. So what does that represent? Another 49,000 hours of additional transit service and the associated uh, vehicles, about 14 vehicles to deliver that, and some additional investments in terms of just collective agreements we have with transit, but the other driver is a maintenance and storage facility for transit. So as transit has grown beyond the mountain transit storage facility, we need another storage facility. And that is currently programmed with the lower city. So about $396 million for that facility. And that's uh, one of the factors affecting transit in 2024. These services for 230 million, 158 million in housing services, and then you'll see a number of other services that make up the majority of the 2.4 billion. Busy slide. I'm not going to take you through the slide, I promise. What I wanted to focus on is, is some of the challenges council has through the 
next few weeks as they finish their deliberations on the 2024 budget. There's a number of services the municipality provides that city council municipality do not have control over. Provincial government provides municipalities the mandate for child care, how we will deliver child care, long-term care, how we will deliver long-term care, Ontario Works, how we will administer Ontario Works. So we call these programs cost-share programs because a municipality and province, we share in the cost of these programs. So if we look at housing, social services, public health and emergency services, which is paramedic services, and then the provincial statutory impacts that I spoke to earlier, development charges, they represent about a billion dollars out of the $2.4 billion. So if I get you just to remember that figure, a billion dollars. So you'll see out of the various pieces of pie, we still rely very much on property taxes. Property taxes are a principal source of revenue. But if you recall that figure of billion dollars, we receive about 60 cents for every dollar we spend in those programs, meaning you as local taxpayers make up the difference. So while we deliver those services, we don't determine how we deliver those services or service levels. So I'll touch a bit upon some of that inequity in terms of who pays what for, for services, including cost sharing services. So you'll see the rest of the our funding sources, uh, including reserves. You may recall in that real, earlier slide, the mayor giving direction to try to affect affordability and reduce that 14.2%. We have a four-year strategy on reserves, what we're on reserves, about $271 million on reserves but in a responsible way as we, we built up some of our reserves, especially during COVID. We knew COVID recovery would be challenging and we set aside $32 million for COVID recovery. So we're gonna draw on that reserve as part of our housing strategy. So reserves, development charges as it relates to growth projects, and then a number of other uh, revenue services, including investment income and payment of the wood taxes. Another busy slide. So this is where an average taxpayer's property taxes go. So inclusive of the 7.9%, it would bring an average household's property taxes to about $5,170. One portion of that, about $590, we collect and just send the money to the province for education. We have no role in it. We collect it if you're a business, HST, you collect it, you remit. Same, same situation for municipalities. You collect the education, property tax, and we re remit it to the province. And then there's these other programs we've been speaking a bit about this evening. Social services, public health, housing, police, other boards and agencies as conservation authorities and police. Again, council doesn't determine the service levels for those, uh, those organizations. They advise council what their required budget is. That translates into a portion of the property tax bill and we collect and remit it to the boards and agencies, including conservation authorities and police. And then possible development and DC exemptions. Here's the challenge Councillor Wang has in the rest of council. Out of your property tax bill, about half of the property tax bill, about $2,600 is going towards those agencies or those services that we don't control. So in order to affect the affordability of property taxes, council is left with trying to manage the other half of the property tax bill. And so you can imagine if you're facing the 8%, 7.9% increase, you're only left with half of the pie to affect that affordability. And that is part of the challenge, not only city council, but other municipalities are facing, especially given the challenges around opioid mental health, homelessness, and climate emergencies. So 
So in terms of, of the 70 services we currently provide, we have contractual agreements with, uh, with respect to employees. We have collective bargaining agreements. We have government benefits we have to meet, employer benefits. They represent about $36 million in additional pressures in 2024. There's inflationary pressures. I appreciate all, all uh, homeowners, residents are facing them inflationary pressures if you go to the grocery store, if you go purchase you know, big ticket items uh, such as vehicles or furniture, you're seeing the impact of inflation. We're seeing it too. So we're investing approximately $411 million in capital in 2024. I can tell you the number of our projects are coming in way over budget. And in part because steel, structural steel, it's, we've seen a 20% increase in the price of structural steel. We've seen 16% increases in aggregates. So we're seeing that inflationary pressure as well as it relates to some of the projects we're delivering. Talked a bit about transit service expansion. Those are the 49,000 additional hours, uh, additional funding for social housing. So, so this is one of those examples where the province advises the municipality of what we have to do. So with respect to housing providers, including City Housing Hamilton, uh, it could be Inwell, it could be Kiwanis, uh, Good Shepherd. The provincial government says, City of Hamilton, you're gonna provide additional funding to those housing providers to offset inflation. Inflation as it relates to the util utility bills, inflation as it relates to property taxes, so for 2024, that's another $2.6 million. Again, the province tells us what to do, but there's no corresponding income coming from the province to offset that. There were some additional investments council made in 2023 that uh, we implemented for a full year in 2024, and then council approved some user fee increases. So these are your recreation user fees, uh, as well as some of our other user fees. They, they were increasing by about 4%, 4.4. That generates about $8.8 million. And then, as I mentioned, the mayor told senior leadership team, go find some savings. So senior leadership team have identified just short of $16 million in some operational savings for 2020. Try to go quickly because I think I was told that 15 minutes. <laughs> so, so again, what I want to touch upon, and I might have skipped over a slide, but uh, so I'll touch upon these two slides and then I'll try to move a little faster. What what this busy graph shows is the blue graphs, bar graphs, is municipal funding for these provincial shared programs. Ontario Works, Long Term Care child care and housing. And what you can see is since 2019, the municipality has been investing more in those programs. And then the white bar graphs represent federal and provincial funding. And you can see that they too increased, but mainly in 23 and 24. And so what this was tied to is the federal child care funding, 10 cents a day, Dollars. So ten dollars a day, or ten dollars a day, not ten cents. <laughs> and what you'll see is what we tried to do was control for the Canada Child Care Program, and so the green line now is the federal and provincial funding for all those other services: Ontario Works, uh, Child Care, Public Health, Housing, and you can see their level of municipal contribution. That's hardly changed from that period 2019 to 2024. Same thing, we controlled we child care from Hamilton's expenses. And this yellow or gold line shows you in 2019, we're paying about $123, uh, sorry, $123 million for those programs. 2024, double that, $245 million, just over this time span, 2019. So what you'll hear municipal finance professionals say is property taxes 
is really a regressive form of taxation to pay for these programs. What we mean by that is, irrespective of what the household earnings is, every household pays the same tax rate for those services. You'll pay a different property tax rate based on your assessed value, but the tax rate's the same for all those services, irrespective of what the earnings are in that household. So we looked at Hamilton, Peel, and Toronto just for 2024. We wanted to see how we are comparing. And so you can see in terms of now per household, we're spending about $691 per household just for housing, just for housing and homelessness. Similar to Peel, a little higher than Toronto. Then we said, how does that relate in terms of household income affordability? So you can see Hamilton's household income averages. This is average citywide, $111,000. Peel, $141,000. Toronto, $128,000. Then you'll see Halton, who's spending about $331 per household for housing and homelessness. But their average household income is about $170,000. And why we wanted to share this with council, and why we'll share this with the province as well, is in Hamilton, an average taxpayer, in terms of the cost of housing relative to household income, is paying three times as much as our neighbors adjacent to us in Baltimore region, Burlington, Oakville. And this really relates to the regressiveness of property taxes. You can see the ability to pay is much greater in these communities. Demand is far less, and we as Hamilton taxpayers are absorbing more of the cost, more of the burden in terms of funding these services, which really should be put on some other form of taxation like income tax or consumptive taxes, which are more progressive in terms of taxing according to ability to pay. So again, we just wanted to reiterate as we're facing these types of trends, what we're seeing is this inequity in terms of who pays. And I can take this analysis and I can apply it across the city of Hamilton. And I'm gonna see something similar. I'm gonna see household incomes in Ward 3, Ward 4, much lower than Ward 12, Ward 50. So lower city of Hamilton versus Ancaster Dundas. And again, as I mentioned, it's the same tax rate. Doesn't matter where you live, what you earn in Hamilton, you're paying that same percentage tax rate for these services. And so this is something that you know, the province has to work with municipalities on, is a redistribution of those programs uh, according to affordability or ability to pay. So just a bit in terms of where we sit relative to some other municipalities, and each municipality has their own issues. We just provide this to council in terms of just the awareness of where other municipalities are sitting. Let's we'll see Toronto's 10.5% by like highlight in Toronto's not only are they 10.5%, that's assuming they get a quarter billion dollar uh, payout from the federal government for 2024, otherwise they're at 16.5%. So I'm thankful I'm not the CFO for the city of Toronto and I'm the CFO for the city of Hamilton. And then you'll see other municipalities, a few of these, um, there's strong mayor powers where the mayor's dictated what the budget is. Not quite sure they're going to be there at year end. Um, not sure how sustainable those budget increases and tax increases are, but we'll have to be. So, in terms of our capital program, um, just very quickly, what it really focuses on we talk about asset management. We know we have a lot of assets that are in. You are walking sidewalks, uh, using public transit, driving your vehicle. You'll see a lot of assets that need replacement. So we built in a 10-year strategy in terms of investing into those assets. So about 1% dedicated towards improving those assets and improving the quality of those assets. We talked a bit about <coughs> financial change in terms of who pays for growth, uh, as well as inflationary pressures for our capital programs. And you'll see again about $412 million 
we're investing in 2024 in infrastructure, airport programs. Transportation represents the majority of our assets, uh, about uh, 122 million out of the 412, and that is roads, bridges, traffic signals, sidewalks, those assets, and they make up the majority of our assets. In terms of transit, we talked a bit about the maintenance storage facility, as well as uh, some buses that are being purchased for those additional 49,000 hours and some buses that are in life. Talked about those development charge impacts and then a number of our other programs or services that have a structure plan. And I won't go through these, they're part of the presentation, they're available to you, it just provides a little expansion in terms of these programs, what's driving some of the major investments in 2024. And I'm available if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. You have some nice. Hi, everyone. So, do we have any questions right now? Please. Hi, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> One question about um, I understand the budget and I understand how it works. I worked in finance for many years for banks. Um, I know you were talking about the ones that funding is coming from other provincial things. Is there a um, percentage that needs to be met? For example, you mentioned a few cases where our contribution in those areas has gone up. For example, in social housing, I believe. Are we required to reach a certain percentage? And like part B of my other, uh, there's a lot of development funds and new development and investors and things like that. And investors are here. I mean, I think maybe there's room for not spending so much on that because they are coming and spending here. So Mike, before you answer, could you could you kind of summarize the question? Because we have, we're live streaming too, so sure. they won't have heard Jane's question. So if you can repeat it. So uh, two questions. Yes. The first one with respect to those cost share programs, is there a ratio in terms of what the municipality's share is or should yes. be? Uh, and as well as what control do we have over those. I would say where we do have some control, the council's made that a priority is housing. So if you recall that first pie graph that had 1.6% of the 7.9 is for housing and homelessness, yes. that's in response to council's priority around housing and homelessness. You translated so, to our taxes, like I, my, I, I have no money to pay my taxes, but I might pay money for the taxes of somebody who doesn't have a home. But, Right. Just make sense. I think that if there was some, some wiggle group there. So uh, I will say what, what the strategy we've taken mm -hmm. is, uh, while it's an investment in 2024, I mentioned we're, we're, we're drawing from reserves as part of our strategy. Which is good. And we're doing that with a clear message to the provincial government, that's not sustainable. You can't take money out of your bank account unless you have money going into your bank account each year to offset drawing from it. So it really opens the door for the provincial government to come and have a conversation, a serious conversation, about who should be paying for these services. And I think your second question is, is there a ratio, appropriate ratio? So back in 2019, the city of Hamilton was paying about 30% of the bill, and the federal provincial government was paying 70%. Fast forward 2024, it's almost 50-50. If the provincial federal governments were paying 30% of the bill in 2024, that would be about $90 million. So what is $90 million? That's the equivalent to our annual infrastructure deficit for roads, sidewalk, bridges. We could deal with that deficit in one year if the provincial federal governments met their commitments at the same ratio, same rate as they did in 2019. So they are adjusting their contribution whereas we are kind of forcing it through property taxes so uh, i'll use my my description of yes, what's happening please. it's intentional so okay. so we know we we have correspondence from the provincial government they tell us what our funding is for 2023 24 so their fiscal year is a little different 24 25 25 26 so let's use housing as an example They've told us, City of Hamilton, your budget's $27.8 million each and every year for the next 
next three years. It's not increasing, which is why this reliance isn't trending up. And so that's the challenge the city council is facing and other municipalities is provincial governments not, or federal government investments are not keeping up with inflation and they're not keeping up with the housing prices. And so we're left on our, to our own accord in terms of addressing some of those challenges. I think Jane was also kind of asking about investors. Yes. So that was how we used to pay, that's how we used to generate revenue, was that when there was a massive investment, we could charge something called a development charge. This yeah. new provincial government has essentially slashed our ability to grab or to have revenues from those investments. So that means that a way for us to actually make money and to actually help offset this because when you have a massive investment, like a condo building or anything like that, you need to have a road to get to it. You need to have sewers, you need to have electrical. That's where we would act, that's where we would capture that revenue from an investment to pay for those. But this provincial government has said, they have literally said no more. So now we are scrambling, and this is why Mike is talking about development charge exemptions and the fact that we now have to offset those potential revenues. So, so that was a principal source of funding growth related projects, new roads, new sidewalks, they changed rules, a portion of the library could be paid for, um, and it was always discounted for existing residents. So developers never paid the full cost for growth. There was always a portion that, that was applied to local taxpayers. Creators. This is how I would like to summarize in terms of what's transpiring. I appreciate the way that the councillor's uh, describing it. It'll be a, less, a little less polite. Uh, the provincial government has said, City of Hamilton, you will collect $34 million less from developers in 2024. And that's not getting any additional infrastructure investments. That's just changing uh, who pays for it. Pascal wants us to stand with him. Okay. <laughs> So, so, if, so if all these municipalities and all these other cities and that, and the government kept on giving them money to keep up with all this and that, our taxes would go up anyway, wouldn't it? We'd have big taxes for them. Correct? Yes. So if they yes. give us more money, yeah. they give us more money, more money, and then more money, who's going to pay for all that? Yeah. We're going to pay for it anyway. So the comment is there's one tax pay. Irrespective yeah. if, if you're delivering municipal taxes, provincial taxes, federal taxes. So it's only don't, the end. don't disagree. Where where I just to my earlier point is that the demand for services vary though from one municipality to the other. So we, we showed a bit about Halton region in term, terms of demand for housing and homelessness. Also, if you think about Halton region, they're principally built out, meaning they aren't building anymore. So this issue of development charges, they're not facing the same pressure because they collected development charges from developers during earlier years of development. So if you're a Hamilton and you're seeing much higher development, we're disproportionately being impacted by that change, these development charges. So don't disagree, one taxpayer, but the question is, are, should all of these costs be borne by, for instance, Hamilton, versus should they be shared across the provincial uh, government? Because again, if you're in Hamilton, you're probably facing, I know you're fa we're facing a di disproportionate burden versus other communities. And frankly, those other communities have higher uh, household income levels and a greater ability to pay for those social programs. How about stopping the spending? Yeah. You know, it really bugs me. You guys, you can sit there and say 8%, as if it was next to nothing. You're into the group reserve fund right now. You've got spending going out of sight. Oh, some of these numbers are nuts. 21% increase in city clerk, correct? Okay, 8% on average for most of the files, 21 to the city clerk, 31.8 to boards and agencies. Really? 46% for consulting fees. What the hell we got people working in the city for? Now, every city employee, when you compare it to the private sector, makes 20 to 30% more than the private sector. 
90% of city employees have a pension plan. 25% of the private sector do. Now, how in heaven's name, and I know you got, how responsible are you for the budget? Do you have a hell of a lot of input into it, or do you just take it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, to be fair, is uh, I'm part of senior leadership team, and we presented this was the budget that senior leadership team proposed. To can, say you why, can you justify those increases? So, I could go one by one and I can explain what's hey, driving um, those. Just give me one the big one 46% increase to consulting consulting so so i can i can sadly enough i can tell you exactly what drove that 46 percent so so uh half of that went towards uh our housing secretary so this was in response to the housing and homelessness half of that increase about about three hundred fifty thousand dollars was half of that the other half of that increase went towards consultants to help us with what our tax appeals. Why do you need consulting when you have people that are supposed to be capable of making the decisions? So let me. You're yeah. not the only ones that do it. The Fed's yeah. do it. Come on over Everybody's doing it. How are your government's doing it? I guess one, I don't know why you can rest on it. So let me give you an example where all consulting is not. So the, the last. Uh, one of those two factors is around uh, tax assessment appeals. So when big industrial commercial property owners appeal their tax assessment, if they're successful, that means that burden gets put onto residential. So now we use consultants to help the city in terms of those tax appeals. So we spend about $350,000. In 2022, we reduced saved the tax burden for residential with $8.9 million. So pretty good return on that investment. Like we saved just short of $9 million in lost property taxes by participating and using, there's expertise out there that we don't have, whether it's around industrial properties, commercial. I understand the sensitivity around using consultant, we're hearing it from, from counselors around the use of consultants. How about the accounting that the city does? How the hell can you every year Every department, every file has to have an increase. They work so they use all their budget. What kind of consulting is that? Every file does not have expenses. Every year the same. Some years it's less, sometimes it's more, but it's always more with you guys. And how, is, how, how long have you been in the, with the city? 21 years. And how many years have you ever seen a cutback in uh, home taxes? So, so there's always. Have you ever seen one year now? Be honest. No. There, there's never a reduction, but, but you have to recognize that 50% of our budget is employee related costs. Is and and when I, those are tied to collective agreements. Can I ask you another question sure. regarding that too? Have you ever seen layoffs in the city? Never. Never, never, never. Private sector do it constantly, but you never see it. So, so, to be fair, to be fair, we did let go of a number of staff in 2017 to reduce the tax increase. So almost 100, 100 management staff were limited in 2017. All right, so let him finish, please. So again, there is, we recognize the affordability challenge and, and recognizing that our employee-related costs represent half of our overall budget because we provide services. If you provide services, you rely on your staff. So we're always going to have those challenges with respect to collective bargaining, government benefits that change, CPP rates change, uh, benefit costs change. And so that's a driving factor in terms of those property tax increases. It's, it's the fair wage that we pro provide for our staff in terms of the services that we provide. So why are we spending so much money on stoplights? Stoplights? Stoplights, stop each stoplight in general, how much does that cost? Just one. I see about 40 if you're going down Main Street now, brand new. So, just how much for just one of those? Uh, it would be about $15,000. 15000 And the city's better for it. So, I think why is that? That comes back to one of the council priorities, which is safe and thriving neighborhoods. We're looking safe at we're looking at trying to do traffic calming. We're looking at ensuring that we have people that feel safe walking how down the street. People put buttons across the street. Okay, then with your earbuds in, 
heads down, he crosses the street. So, How safe is that? I agreed. How but safe at this is it a bike riding on the road with cars, buses, and trucks? How safe is that for a bike ride? This is why we're working on that. So let me let me just continue with that. Is that what we're looking at from a council priority is a safe and thriving neighborhood for all. Those that drive, those that ride bikes, those that walk, mothers that push their strollers. The idea here is how do we make a Hamilton that is for everyone? So part of that is that we have made significant investments in transportation. So you saw the single largest item is roads, bridges, that's made for cars. And I've seen a bus deal at four hundred some million dollars that three years ago was two hundred and twenty million dollars. That is exactly the challenge that we're all so facing. Why why wasn't why was the that why did we wait until things were trouble? That was before my time. So it wasn't so it just doesn't make sense. Okay, so let's finish that line of thought and then let's move to another question. So GM? Yeah. Just, just on the transit maintenance storage facility, so it's very, it was very much impacted by the post-pandemic inflation. So that's where we saw a 20% increase in steel, 16% uh, increase in aggregate. So we have budgeted for the cost of that project back in 2019. The budget, the budget, you guys looking in the future, right? We do, but but not for those increases. Right? So, so if we looked at the inflation pre-pandemic. You know, we're facing six percent uh, infrastructure. Like post-pandemic, we've never experienced. They've been nine percent, nine percent, sixteen percent, and twenty percent for some of them. So it really was similar to what households are facing post-pandemic. There are just some extraordinary inflationary pressures, but we understand, and we've gone. You know, we've looked to reduce that impact as we've taken from some federal provincial programs. We're asking. The, the federal government for more funding to reduce the cost of that facility on local taxpayers. And we're also asking the provincial government because originally uh, the city of Hamilton paid 27% of the project of that cost and the federal provincial governments paid the balance. And unfortunately they capped their funding. So all the inflationary impacts hitting us. Okay. So again, we're asking them to come back to the table to reduce that impact. So I can start and then if the council wants to add, I will say we need this the transit maintenance storage facility now. If you were to, to drive up to Rymel Road and Upper James and you saw our current facility, you'll see our our buses effectively parked out outside bumper to bumper because there's no space indoors and now there's no space outdoors for the buses. So we've outgrown that facility and we need another facility. And uh, so in terms of, of future demand, I'd say we're there now. As we continue to grow in the next number of years, yes, we'll continue to use that facility. And with respect to, to LRT, as, as we continue to grow the service, our colleagues in, in HSR Transit, they're looking at the alignment of transit in terms of how to feed into LRT and how people are using to have transit you know, it was, it was the previous design, everyone went downtown. So wherever you caught the bus, eventually they made its way downtown. They're now looking at the patterns in terms of how people are using transit to get to from their homes to school to work. And so as they develop that realignment, revisioning of transit, you know, part of that is uh, feeding into LRT for some of those words. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it does. Jack, did you want to one question to your budget person, right? Yes. Now, I've heard for four years that every time I see it, it's a three point four billion dollar LRT. Is it three point four billion dollars right now? Is it price of steel going up twenty percent? They get a, an estimate could be six billion, right? Or whatever, five. What, what was your estimate? Uh, so now three point four, yeah. right? So I, I would expect they're going to have some of they're going to have some uh, some of the same inflationary pressures, 
again, not our budget, so I don't know what, you know, there was an earlier comment about you building contingencies for inflation. In that. I don't know what Metrolinx province built in for a contingency for, for the LRT project, so hard to say whether or not their contingency is enough to offset the price of inflation. But again, you know, in terms of, of the projects, we, we recognize inflation is going to have an impact on all projects, including well, well, like the LRT. Because it's not a not from 5 billion to 13 billion. Yeah. Jack, did you have a question that you wanted to um, bring forward? Um, there are a few questions from uh, people who sent them in regarding the police budget. Police budget. Uh, regarding the police budget and wondering if council does are able to go through the police budget line by line. We obviously saw some conversation on, on that on council. Let's speak to that. So the question is whether or not City Council has the authority to go over the police services budget line by line, similar to a city different. So again, uh, Council has to work within rules or provincial legislation. The police services budget is governed by what's referred to as Police Services Act. That legislation defines the role of City Council as it relates to the budget. What Council's authority on the police services budget is the board, the police services board, is to present a global budget to city council. What's that mean? They present an operating budget and a capital budget. And city council has the authority to either approve the operating budget and capital budget, or to refer that budget back to council, and they could refer, or sorry, to the police services board, and they could refer it with instructions or just refer it back. City Council doesn't have the right or authority to go over the police services budget line by line, which is why we included in those programs or services where the provincial government says you will pay for the service, but you don't have control over the service level or the mandate for that, that service. So short answer is City Council does not have the authority to go over the police services budget line item by line item. The police chief presents it to the board and then the board recommends it to city council. I think that was my question. Sorry to interrupt. I had a kind of issue in that I was trying to contact the, this team of bylaw and police that used to go out at night. And now there's no such thing. I had an issue every night for a month, let's say the summer. I had no response from the city, I had no response from so, bylaw, and I didn't have any response from the police. But I understood that there was a team. Yeah. in the past that we so, took about together. Yeah. But thank you, Jane. Yes. I think that that's de definitely a ward four issue and I wanted to make sure that we're mindful of uh, GM and Eric's time. So yes. I want to keep to the budget. So let's ask questions on the budget. Yes, sir. Um, so you have people that sit on the police services budget. You may not question the police chief as to why do we have this? Why do we have that? Why do we need to improve that? And can they tell the chief, go back, sharpen your pencil, every other place has to do and start cutting back just like you have to cut back and they, they may not that police certainly that well, you can as counselors but cannot that police services board now is the police service board somebody that's in groups with the uh, the uh, police chief or are they somebody that can be resisted to the police chief Suggestions to maybe we'll add another horse, maybe we'll add six more dogs. I don't know. So I definitely feel like I'm back home. <laughs> so, uh, does somebody from the council sit on the police yeah. Three people on so, so, if I can just, just in, in terms of the question, yes, there's a police services board. So, so the police chief presents his budget to the police services board. Police services board can ask questions regarding the budget that. The police chief has presented to to the board for their consideration similar to the councillors asking staff questions regarding our budgets uh, so yes the police services board can ask the chief questions in terms of how he is presenting the needed investments whether it's it's staffing or or equipment in terms of delivering police services to the community so that's the role of the board and then the board ultimately recommends a budget for council to consider. Mr. Yannick, please. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yannick, please. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I'm just curious. So the province is essentially mandating that municipality has to allow committees of social services housing and whatnot. That's pretty sort of essential, right? But my concern is there seems to be an endless amount of money from the taxpayers being funded for those services, and yet we see no resolve or we see no better in the situation. I can't divide longer than 10 minutes without seeing someone openly smoking crack or using intravenous drugs. Um, the park by my house in Fernley Park is just scrolling. Um, someone just the other day decided to drive the truck through it and do you know it's, it's top. Now, I assume that the tax funds are also paid to groom that park and to maintain it and to eventually, hopefully, make it safe for families to utilize. So, why is this amount of money, this, this predetermined, mandated amount of money, seemingly not being used effectively? To make Hamilton a safe place. I grew up in the Rosedale area. I spent almost 20 years um, of my childhood down there. I moved back with my wife to start a family down there, and I will be regretting our decision moving down there. Not only would we have to pay a premium for the home down there, because it's supposed to be a safe and uh, desirable area for young families to start, it's now turned into a bedroom. Why is this millions and millions, if not millions of dollars? Not rectifying these issues that everyone is seeing on a daily basis. So, so I, I can start, and uh, so fully appreciate and understand. You know what what you're witnessing within our community, uh, and I'll say you know, uh, I do feel for those individuals in our community who are facing some of these challenges, whether whether it's tied to opioids or mental health issues. And if I could just preface sorry, right after yeah. the fact that I said. We work in that time, right? So by no means is this me saying this person doesn't deserve this, he doesn't deserve that. I do get frustrated from time to time, absolutely. I have stressed out with any and the decisions that we call. But all of this money that's being poured into this thing that you can't even turn the TV on without saying, oh, it's an epidemic, it's this and that, but nothing is changing. So again, my opening comments wasn't to suggest that. Uh, I just I don't have to practice because people think I don't understand that. Yeah. So, so I will say some of the investments we're making are short term investments. I'll, I'll give you an example. We're spending $13 million, or we're projected to spend $13 million on hotel overflow. So, what does that mean, hotel overflow? That is because we don't have space in our shelter system especially for for mothers, mothers with children, uh, for females, there is just not sufficient shelter space for these individuals. So the alternative is they're on the street. And so a short term uh, solution investment is around hotel overflow. We're, we're leveraging hotels to house these individuals. Is it a solution? It's not a solution. A, a more sustainable solution is sustainable housing so just as an example in terms of of the strategy that's been presented to council uh with respect to housing and what's reflected in the budget what we've earmarked is 30 million dollars towards sustainable housing and that was in response to what housing providers had asked city council in the community in well good shepherd Juanes. they all asked we need city of hamilton some some seed money, some investment, to generate $194 million for 418 supported homes in the community. And so what we presented is $30 million of investment to leverage funding from the federal and provincial government, $198 million in capital and about $24 million operating. Housing and loan will not be the solution. They need the support services. And again, that's what we are hearing from housing providers and from the community. We've earmarked some funds in 2024 towards that. But the city of Hamilton won't solve this problem. So again, we put $30 million aside, waiting for the federal, provincial governments and community partners as well to come forward. So are there some are we expecting some positive outcomes in terms of investment? Yes. Are they sustainable? No, we recognize. Putting people up in hotel rooms, encampment, and encampment enforcement is not a long-term solution towards housing and homelessness, um, but we try to put some money aside towards something that may be more sustainable. So 
Uh, last three questions. Sorry. Finish up, finish up, because I want to get to the last three questions. Would it not make more sense to take that money and find out what they sort of addiction services as opposed to housing and actually help people with the root of the problem? Because if you're going to provide housing to these people who have drug issues, ultimately what they're going to do is just do the drugs under the cover of the housing provider. And then get kicked out, right? So. And it would be, and, and I'll simply say again, not not wanting to redirect or point fingers, not our mandate. You know that that's the provincial government mandate, and we are asking them to step up their investment in terms of you know those treatments to avoid not avoid or lessen the potential impact for people who are housed and who may lose their housing because of some of those addiction problems. Well, and that's potentially what's happening to us because the more we increase the property tax. So don't disagree. Uh, again, ideally, if everyone came together to be part of the solution, every door we refer to a door. If you, if in well, if one is were to build an affordable housing project, it's about five to six hundred thousand dollars per unit, and and the city can't afford or fund five to six hundred thousand dollars for each unit. In well, is a not for profit. They can, clearly can't go to a bank and say. You know, give me a loan so I can build affordable housing, which has no business case in terms of sustaining those assets or revenues. So it comes back to that $30 million that we set aside, asking federal provincial governments, you know, please come to the table and let's work with these not-for-profit groups to provide not only that roof, but the support services that, that those individuals need so that can so that they can stay housed. But, but the, the, the so, so, uh, so during, during COVID, uh, we did provide an allowance because people were restricted in terms of, of food. Now. now it's more, you know, back to the bare essentials in terms of just shelter. And then as well as, as some additional Costs in terms of security for these facilities as well. But do you not think 120,000 year for families is an exorbitant amount of money to spend? I would rather spend that 120,000 towards a long term solution than a short term solution. There's no such thing as affordable housing, I guess, in the words. No. So a good portion of our rent problem is there is a big component of the rest of the world and taxes on the day. So there's also a huge chunk of commercial taxes. And like I own commercial property. And obviously, you heard me by saying this as well, but commercial properties within this whole city are grossly, grossly, grossly underassessed. My commercial property right now would be worth $790,000 if I wanted to sell it today. However, the taxes I pay on that is based on $300,000. So I can only imagine what actual real companies um, are doing for them. So if we get spent the money or the time to have MPAC reassess, Commercial property, the gain of the taxes alone would be exorbitant, which is great, and I'll pay more, and that's fine. That's like here nor there. But why are we not giving the people that they take in the most? Because I might mind the commercial rental, so I can, but why not take like why not take those people? Like why so, so to the question around consulting and why are we spending three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in consulting for impact tax appeals? In part, that's why we're doing it, to try to preserve that commercial and industrial tax base. First off, is, is MPAC's not our role. It's a provincial agency, and they do it. Um, and, and the council will invite me back during reassessment. But everyone, you're all assessed. If you own property in Hamilton, you're assessed the value of that property as of January 1st, 2016. That's, that's what the value of that property is. The next reassessment is next year. Oh, it's this year. Well, 2025, but it gets implemented in 2025. 
So assessed values will go up, but for all of them, no. So we'll come back. The counselor, I'll ask the counselor to bite me back. The provincial rule is when assessments go up, under legislation, we have to bring down tax rates so it's revenue neutral for the municipality. We can't collect any additional tax dollars from assessment changes. So does that mean that the municipal services would have to suffer? No, no, no. So it, it doesn't change uh, our budget. What effectively does, let's say assessment values double. It doesn't mean we collect two times the amount of tax rate. Effectively, we have to reduce the tax rate so that we're generating the same budget we need in 2025 as we do in 2024 through those changes. So, so assessments not, I think there's some misconception that when properties increase in value, oh, the city will collect more money because of that. No, there's an offset uh, and, we're, and we're required to do it. To the question around commercial, I would hope that in 2025, there's going to be a benefit to residential because of reassessment. I'm not counting on it. So why am I not counting on it? If you've lived in Hamilton since pre-amalgamation and you saw the housing market during the pandemic and people moving to Hamilton, including this ward for affordable housing, and you saw the price escalation in housing, I don't expect commercial and industrials valuations to increase at the same rate. Everyone likely went up. But when residential goes up more than commercial and industrial, that means they pay less of the cost and residential pays more of the cost under reassessment. So while I hope I'm wrong, I'd be surprised if I was wrong if, if we didn't see more of the cost being borne by residential. Okay, last question. So, so council did. So the question is, if we have underutilized uh, affordable social housing units, why aren't we investing in those units to bring them on street to provide housing? So council did that in 2023, about 500, 400, 90, 400, 476, 476 uh, city housing units. So that's a great investment and great strategy, frankly, because if it's 500 to $600,000 a unit to build, and you can you know, improve, right. renovate a unit for $50,000 so it can be you know, used for housing, that's a better investment. So council, through what's been presented to them, is $20 million over four years to do exactly that with all the housing providers, not only city housing Hamilton, Juan is Good Shepherd, is we, we call it end of mortgage. So these housing providers who need additional funding to ensure that their assets are in good good state so that they can be used for housing. There's about $20 million over four years to provide to the housing providers to do exactly that. And at, in 2023, we actually put forward $5.6 million to City Housing Hamilton to bring those 476 units online. And the big reason why they said was that previous councils had been cutting City Housing Hamilton's budgets year over year. And then what happens was they were not able to turn over those units. So this is why we injected them with the $5.6 million last year to help them get online. So as of January 1, I think they brought 100 and something, 100 and something units online. They're still looking at another 300 and something units, but they're actively trying to work with Habitat for Humanity, Threshold Building, all of these other nonprofits to actually help them get online. But thank you very much. Can we give a round of applause to So thanks again. Thanks for inviting me back home. And I don't think I'll be invited again because I had a half hour and we're an hour and 10 minutes. Into I think you were the star of the show, Mike. That's for sure. Okay.
Um, and then, so Mike, you don't have to stay. What we'll do, uh, we do have additional questions. So what we'll do is, if you have additional questions, please talk to Jack right here. We will have them written down and we will send them over to Gian Zagarek just so that he can get a sense and we can respond back to you, okay? So that's, but we're gonna continue moving on with our program. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you. your evening. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. So I'm mindful of time too. So going on to the uh, Ward 4 update. So the city of Hamilton and uh, Public Works has actually got 10 new files. So we're expecting everyone to log online to the Engage Hamilton website and, uh, and take a look at some of the names of these files. They're pretty fun because some of them is like only math and snow. It's pretty fun. Um, but if you could just check out the engage.hamilton.ca website, it actually also has a ton of programs and um, initiatives that is open for public feedback. So the name your plow is just only one of them, but I think there's a parks master plan, there's, there's a whole pile of them for you to go on to. As well, one of the different areas that we've been working, that the city has also been working on is the plow tracker, because not that we've had a lot of snow this year, but the fact is we do wanna ensure that Residents know where their plows are and when they're coming, when they're going to be coming down the street. So check out hamilton.plowchapter.com. In terms of capital projects, Barton Street is finally getting something going. It has been a bit of a slog, um, but we have, especially around Barton and Woodward area, we had a massive amount of reconstruction. Natasha has uh, <laughs> let us know about that. So thank you so much, Natasha. But that was actually a massive um, investment of water sewer mains and a bit of resurfacing. But then what we ended up seeing, oh, and that hair field. So moving backwards to Barton Street, Barton Street, and this you'll see in a slide later on, but Barton Street, we will be doing a massive um, functional review. Everything from Ferguson Street and Ward 2 all the way to the Red Hill. It's the next one. Oh, I got a stand on the side. I'm just worried about this thing. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> um, so. So Barton Street Functional Review will be Ferguson to uh, Red Hill. And part of that Ferguson, uh, the functional review will include just what does that roadway look like specifically to ensure that we're building in enough of the infrastructure and resources that we need. That is coming up, but that doesn't necessarily mean shovels in the ground and it doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna be actually ripping up the road yet. So I think it's prudent because uh, Barton Street has had no investment for the last 30-ish years. So I think that it's a prudent investment in figuring out what that functional review looks like and how do we use it better. And especially because um, we have other major investments that are coming down into the, into the city. So uh, this is welcome news that I'm super excited about. So uh, I'll give you more information as I see it. Oh. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Wait, where am I going? The circle one? Oh my God. Next time we're gonna definitely do the clicky things because this mouse thing is not working. Um, oh, Pascal, you're gonna run this one? Yeah. Okay, so we have other upcoming infrastructure. As you can see, the Kenilworth Reservoir. So that's the one that's up Kenilworth access and it's the area that I share with Tom Jackson, Ward 6. So that's being totally redone. We did actually have some of the soil that was all remediated. So now it's just shoring it up a little bit more. The Queenston Road storm sewer. And then we also have several large uh, replacement valves. If you were around the Knox and Mead area in the Parkview neighborhood, there was a massive water main uh, break. So that has all been rejuvenated and restored. 
But this is just another indication of how much we are in need of our infrastructure being replaced. In this ward, we are one of the oldest water mains in all of the city. In fact, the Knox and Mead um, water main was a 110 year old cast iron lead pipe that just that, that got destroyed, that got a giant leak. So I was thankful that the water people were able to uh, stem the water and ensure that we replaced it. But Ward 4 is some of the oldest pipes in all of the city. So that's one of the challenges. And so this is where I kind of feel like water is pretty important to us. So uh, this is where we're going to be looking at those level of investments. Development projects. So um, Pascal was really great pulling this information together. We've had a lot of development happening in the city. Uh, we've actually had many conversions from actual like single family homes into multiplexes, so duplex, triplex, quadplex. We've also had um, more investment in apartments. We are also going to see more investment like 1284, so this is Delta Secondary, still on the books, still at OLT, not sure when that's gonna happen. So uh, that's still an appeal. We're still kind of seeing, I'm not really sure what that's gonna look like yet, but we wanted to keep you apprised that we're watching it very closely as well. Next one. 1842, this is the Brock University um, development. Also, not really sure where that's going yet. The OLT appeal has dropped, but it seems like they're just kind of holding on to it for a little bit. These are some of the challenges that we're dealing with because what we have is developers that buy up land and then sit on it when we need housing to come in faster. So part of my advocacy is trying to get them to figure out how do we get shovels in the ground and make this work. A lot of challenges from the developer side is that they're saying interest rates are too high. It costs too much money to actually make these homes. So this is how we're trying to mitigate some of that. But again, this comes back to, we gotta get housing, and so this is a huge push from council, huge push from me, to try and figure out how do we get these investments going as quickly as possible. Roxboro Park, uh, just down at Reed. It's actually got a lot going on for it. You guys must have seen all of the towers and that sort of thing. So I will say, again, we're keeping track of it. We're watching that really closely. It is moving forward. I have not heard anything negative yet. So let's, as a ward and as a community, let's all just keep an eye on it. At the Queenston Traffic Circle, you guys must have seen some of those massive investments. Those are two six-story buildings, all affordable housing from City Housing Hamilton. That is one of those investments that Mike was talking about in terms of co-investment from the city, co-investment from the feds, co-investment from the province in order to facilitate 82 affordable housing units for women and families. That's changed from the original plan. So there's, yeah, originally it was only supposed to be one building and now we've gotten rapid housing dollars. Oh, really? So they do have two, two buildings still. Oh, well, that one is just a good thing. Okay, well, this is what I have today. So, yep, but it's under construction. Ideally, we can, we already broke ground on it. Right now, it's just the first building. We're looking at breaking ground for the second building. Funding is already in place, so ideally, we're rare to go. It is modular building, so that's why it's going up a lot faster. They're working with a Canadian company in BC to actually come in, like, essentially Lego block it in to just try and build it up faster. 851 Lawrence, this is the Valerie Homes. Um, so they're also, we've already um, started moving forward on some of the planning, but they're, they haven't broken ground yet. So again, we're gonna keep track of that. Yannick, what's up? I'm just curious, because obviously it's one of the old houses, but the buildings are I don't think so. No. No. I lived in Toronto. Yeah. Am I mistaken to think that if you were not? No. No. I live in Toronto. Yeah. Isn't it funny? Because I read all that stupid stuff that happened. Our homes 
city housing development, greater production of our housing and housing. So those townhouses, though, so City Housing Hamilton, the one you're talking about is 108 units, it's a 10-story building. That's the only City Housing Hamilton building at Reed. Um, but there is like 74 townhouse dwellings. All of those are averaging almost $800,000. So I'm not really sure how but that that might be a whole macroeconomic conversation that i don't really know how to answer yeah okay moving on um 851 lawrence other good news thank you pascal for putting that in <laughs> we um this new year's the mayor held three levies and i have been reading a lot of social media about it, asking why the mayor has spent so much money on these levies. I will tell you that it is to celebrate Order of Hamilton recipients. Order of Hamilton recipients are volunteers who have given their time in the community, and this year she celebrated 20 Order of Hamilton recipients. She put them in three municipal centers, so she didn't pay money to rent them. She literally provided coffee it was like $400 for all three. I don't know where these critics are coming at her saying that she's spending tens of thousands of dollars on these parties, but I think $400 to celebrate 20 volunteers, I think is a pretty good return on investment. So I hope that you will take all of that social media that you're reading with a little grain of salt and just understand that everyone is feeling this pinch. I'm a taxpayer too, I feel this pinch too. But we actually had a gentleman from Ward 4, Mr. Pays Yosef. He is the founder of the Hamilton Black Film Festival. So he was our one and only Ward 4 recipient. So next year, if you guys know any awesome stellar Hamiltonians that deserve to be recognized, please consider the Order of Hamilton as that place to sponsor them. Uh, we've got disc golf that's happening out here. And welcome to the Golf and Country, I mean, sorry, Kings Forest Golf Club. This is not a Golf and Country Club, this is just a golf club. Um, and then we also have several items that are available for residents. The Better Homes Hamilton. So if you do want to apply for a loan, it is an interest-free loan to actually make green investments in your home. This Better Homes Hamilton uh, allows you to have $20,000 in this I thought it was no interest fixed rate loan, but Pascal wrote loan interest, so I will trust in what Pascal was saying. Um, and then the last bit, which was a crazy amount of time and effort, uh, is our renovations bylaw. So I want to tell you that this work has been ongoing for the last four years from Councilor Narendra Nand and Ward 3. This is not just a renovations thing, it's actually a suite. It's three different types of bylaws. One is the safe apartment bylaw. Two is the renovation and relocation, AKA renovations bylaw. And the last one is tenant support systems. The safe apartment bylaw is going to be a whole new suite of bylaws specifically focused on property standards. Essentially having bylaw officers go into apartment buildings and say that mold is totally not property standards. That light fixture that's bare bulb hanging from the, from the ceiling, not property standards. So the idea is to ensure that we are creating safe homes for rental properties and ensuring that everyone gets that same equitable and human rights based approach. That also will include things like the maximum heat bylaw. That might also include access to water. That's all part of the suite of the safe apartment bylaw. The second suite of it is the renovation and relocation bylaw, which really means any landlord that wants to remove their tenant all under the basis of renovations has to be able to prove and show that they have to have their tenant leave in order to do those renovations. They need to get a license for that. If they are able to do that, the relocation aspect of it is that they have to ensure similar accommodations are found for their tenant and that they their tenant gets first right of refusal to come back to the apartment. 
So that is part of the renovation and relocation by the end. In regards to the N13, right? So I just don't understand if the N13, as per the Ontario tribunals, say that all the landlord is required to do is provide three months of compensation and first right of refusal. So how did the city come in and say, you know what? Don't worry, Ontario, we got you. We're going to make them do this instead. So we're actually not contravening that at all. What we're doing is to say, most, most of the time, if you need to do a renovation, you need to come to the city to get a building permit. That's what the current email here is established. The permits are in place. So that's... order the eviction to start renovating the building. So this is where we found a little bit of a loophole. Yes, that is correct. But where yeah, that I'm not a landlord. I'm just, so, yeah, so I'm just literally like I'm not a residential landlord. I'm just trying to figure out how we could like why we spend so much time and money and effort into doing this when like, something else could drop in. So it is think of it as not trumping it, but thinking think of it as it fits alongside with it. So the N13 process is its own process. It is what it is. So we're not touching that because we can't. Oh, well, the landlord tenant board, that's their purview, that is where they are. But you got to think of that as like the before aspect of it. What we're trying to do is we are trying to ensure that landlords that are trying to improperly renovate their tenants are held to a standard where it has to meet a threshold in order to get the building permit. So where we have that like sort of leeway is how we issue the building permit. So in order for us to see that this is meant to be a displacement of a, a rental tenant, we'll say to you, okay, now we're putting in this new bylaw to say, if you are going to evict a tenant for this, what we need to, is you need to show us that you have to be able to do this in order for us to issue the building permit. Because that's where our purview is. Our box is where the building permit is. I hope that I'm kind of explaining it. It's like building permit. I don't know. Maybe it just doesn't make sense to me because this, in order to have an N13 eviction go through the landlord tenant board tribunal, you have to have building permits. They don't say, oh, you know what? Well, if the tenant, you get me the permits down the road. So I just don't understand why we spent so much money doing that. But then, see, in order for you to have a building permit, you need to tell us why you need that building permit. No, I, I get that. But why, why put more? That's the point to put more work on landlords that are wrongfully evicting tenants. So if part of that N13 is requires you to have the building, can I get back to you on that? Okay. Because it might be a fuller conversation and I may not have all of the right words to actually adequately explain what I'm trying to say. Okay. All right, next one. What's coming up? So we're looking at golf courses. I'm pretty sure this one's not on the docket because it's got so much like green space. The ones that we're really looking at are ones like Shadow, where traditionally membership has been really down. It's also in some of the best parts of the city. They don't have the same assets that we do, like all the same trees and the green space that we do. So they're actually looking at all golf courses. We're looking at uh, HSR rider recovery and some of the fare incentives. So it, that's also been a hot topic these days, but essentially we have six months to try and figure that out. And then the new HSR redesign network. So we have an opportunity to provide input into some of the uh, new bus routes. So again, that's all on the engage.hamilton.ca website. Moving on. A bunch of different community events. We'll be able, if you guys have submitted your emails, this will be emailed out to you. So you don't need to try and remember that, but there's a lot of events happening. Next one. Oh, by the way, the Rosedale Family Skate, because I see Heather is here. So the Rosedale Family Skate is, here, is on here. And then that slide is if you see any of our unhoused neighbors, this is the information. You can always contact us, but ultimately it's going here as per the encampment protocol but we wanted to make sure that you had that information just in case. Last one. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, 
I got, I got it. Yes. Um, so uh, for the, um, like if a tenant's living in uh, rent down, will be a little like, I'm in a unique position where I, I go into a lot of the management. So if I see a lot of oh. people's houses, yep. I go into them. People call me, I never meet the landlord and they go to this. And it's not often, but every once in a while, I'll go into a place where they need to just burn that thing to the ground. Is there a number? You can call us, we can call property standards. So it's a quick report. Yeah. There is a way, and we can provide that information too. But yes, you can. we can provide that for the direct call that you can call directly to the property standards people, but also you can send it to us. We can also facilitate that as well. So there's two ways. Okay. We have that information. We can get that to you, Jack. Can we make sure that we can? Okay. Yes, perfect. Yes. Would reaching out to Neil Lumsden and Chad Collins help? It absolutely would because they kind of get, I see Neil Lumsden quite often and I talk his ear off on a lot of stuff, but it always sounds like it's only one person doing that talking. So if there are more voices that do that kind of advocacy to Neil Lumsden, to Chad Collins, to Sarah Jama, it makes it sound like I'm not the crazy one, that I'm not making this up, that I'm not doing it all on my own. This is a ward issue. This is a city of Hamilton issue. So the more voices that we have to speak to other levels of government is going to absolutely help. I would love to. We'll try. But yeah, that's the question of will they come? We'll invite them for the next one uh, in April. And we'll see how that goes. <laughs> But if you also write to their offices, send them an email, um, send them snail mail, uh, all of those are all viable forms of communication to other levels of government. Yes. Sorry. So, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, I did miss that. Okay, yes. Uh, the next one is, it's the next one that she's talking about? Traffic circle at Maine. So, that traffic circle is actually going to be changed. Part of what's happening is Rosewood Road is going to get some LRT enabling, and that will happen sometime this year. So they will be ripping up a bit of the road. They'll make sure that all of the servicing, that like stuff that normally goes in the middle of the road will get moved to the outside of the road because that will also be part of the HSR redesign. So what actually will be happening is at some point in the future, the traffic circle, the big Queens and traffic circle will no longer be a traffic circle it will actually kind of look like a T intersection. And that is to help facilitate HSR buses going around that. And as well, the Queenston traffic circle area will also be a future LRT stop. So this is also part of that LRT enabling. So the fact is Rosewood is the first in the ward to get started on the LRT stuff. At some point in the future, we will see the traffic circle change. Yeah, so as you know, Main Street. So that's where the, you know how the Queenston traffic circle, if you go towards the right side, the big side is turns into Queenston, but then if you go on the other side, it's Main Street. So that's part of that will also be changed over because that will ultimately connect to Parkdale. Main Street will ultimately connect to Parkdale. Parkdale becomes a massive hub, a massive HSR hub, and one of the primary LRT hubs. So the Main Street there is meant to actually facilitate buses so they don't have to go around the traffic circle, they'll go straight down. Yes, it does, but it needs to widen and all of that. I will double check on Delena. 
Pascal has written me some notes. Give me a second. Sanitary sewer upgrades, water main installation, road reconstruction. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be part of the corridor, corridor work. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, it'll, it'll go all the way down closer to Delena. But yeah, that's part of the investments that's going down Main Street. Water main, sanitary sewer upgrades, water main installation, and road reconstruction. Okay. Okay. I'll double check on that. Okay. So I'll say I'll say that. So that's talking about Delina, right? We're talking about the perpendicular. Okay. All I'm going with is what the engineering services team has given me in terms of their notes. Let me check on that. Absolutely. Let's. Where we've made a note of it, Jack. We've made a note, right? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Let me let me double check on that, and that's and I'll go from there. There was another street. Is there a Queenston Road and Sewer Main slide? Queenston Road Storm Sewer. Yeah. Trenchless rehabilitation of Storm Sewer construction plan for 2024. They don't. Uh, they didn't oh. specify exactly where on Queenston. Okay. So this one is another straight note from our engineering services. So we wanted to make sure that you guys knew about that. But I will ask for more information for next time. But it struck me that, well, that's where Pascal's helped me with finding out this information. It's trenchless rehabilitation of the storm sewer, and then the, this construction is planned for 2024. So that I will get some more information on. Do you have more information? Trenchless, I think that's like the what we did in the Delta neighborhood. Oh, the rehabilitation of all those water mains, right? In that in the Delta East neighborhood? But I'm not sure. But let's we'll uh, we'll put that as a note, and we'll get back to you on that because I'm we're going off of notes from engineering <laughs> services. To tell you the truth, I'm not an engineer, so I wouldn't really know exactly. So I just wanted to share that information with you. So let me get back to you on that. Any other questions? Just about yes. Kenilworth. Kenil oh, Kenilworth Avenue. Let me tell you about Kenilworth. Going up from Main Street up towards the mountain? Or no, just going from, even from the traffic circle here to the top of the mountain. Okay, so okay. Up and down. Camelworth Avenue is one of those, it's like my Ahab. <laughs> I'm really trying to work with um, roads and transportation on this. But uh, Pascal, what do you want to say about this before I go on my like? It's so scheduled for 2026. 2026. Yeah. And it's scheduled for. And that's why I count the zeros. Hold on, one, two, three. And it's it's a six. For a Kenilworth Business Improvement Association. Six million. Six million. There would yeah, be a six million. million. Yeah. So it sound, um, Pascal's pulled up the spreadsheet. They give us a spreadsheet, tell us like when these projects will come forward. Kenilworth Street is slated for 2026 at $6 million. I don't know what that looks like yet because frankly, Sam just spent a whole lot of money putting in a lot of concrete on Kenilworth Street. So it's a bit of, like I said, my Moby Dick Ahab moment. 
because it is something that um, I really want to understand what we want to do there. Kenilworth Street, as you know, in the commercial part of it, is really declining. It looks terrible. It has a lot of empty storefronts. And at this point, there are a lot of illegal residences. So I also don't want to be known as the red evictions counselor, where we're evicting residents that cannot afford market rate rents. So I want to be mind, I want to be very, very intentional about what we do with Kenilworth Street. I'm also actively pushing for more affordable housing to come into the ward, come into the city, so we can actually move people that are illegally residing in first level retail spots and move them into a place that's going to be human rights based, dignified, and equity based. That said, one of the areas that we're trying to also do is figure out the Kettleworth traffic circle because it's like putting your hand in, uh, putting your, your life in your hands every single time if you're walking there, if you are riding a bike there, if you are trying to drive there. The Kettleworth traffic circle needs to be fixed. It is going to be double digit, maybe triple digit millions to get this totally redesigned. So again, it's a little bit of my Moby Dick Ahab moment. I'm trying actively to figure out what that looks like. Uh, at this point, I don't have exact ideas, uh, but based on roads and engineering services, 2026, so we'll try and get more information on what that looks like. They might. I might need a consultant after that. So, yes. Thank you for that. So the question was, what about Cannon Street between Ottawa and Kenilworth? Uh, let me tell you, it is my next Moby Dick moment because I've asked that a bunch of times um, because it looks like the kitchen sink on Kenilworth Street, I mean, on Cannon Street. You have drivers, you have cyclists, you have bus lanes, you have left turning lanes, you also have pick up and drop off for Queen Mary. Like it's a little bit of like a dog's breakfast on Cannon Street. So yet another uh, mountain to climb on that one. I'm running out of an analogies and anecdotes, so, but that's the whole point is that that is another one that we're definitely looking at. Another one is also Ottawa Street because as you may or may not have noticed, Ottawa and Cannon, we had a bunch of car accidents. So myself and Narendra, Councilor for Ward 3, have put in um, traffic lights to slow down traffic. It is still a work in progress. I am not going to- It's working way better, like a thousand times much better. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a three phase light. Yeah, so it's that way. so much better. So it's still a work in progress. We're still getting a lot of complaints from drivers about it. Um, but the fact is we're still trying to tweak it. What that means is that we will also have a full main Ottawa street. We're looking at a full redesign of what that looks like because every single intersection on Ottawa street is off kilter. It's weird. Every single one of them. And literally you take your life into your hands every single time you're trying to cross the street. So Narendra and I are looking at Ottawa street as a full redesign um, that we actually have a meeting on that this Friday. Next Friday, next Friday. So that is also yet another mountain that I'm trying to climb to. So it's coming. Yes. I um, right on the corner of um, Kenilworth and Main Street. It's a fairly new building. I, I think it was um, built in the Indigenous Peoples Movement in 1980. And it's, it's only been up for two years and it's all boarded up. Ottawa Main Street? Mm -hmm. So that one is Sacagawea. Oh, Kenilworth and Main. Oh, Kenilworth and Main. Oh, that's going to be LRT. Kenilworth and Main? So that one is Ontario Aboriginal Housing Services. Yes. Yes, because they are trying to get in front of Metrolinx to get a portion of the Ottawa, sorry, the Main and Kenilworth intersection because that has all, most of that has been taken over by LRT. 
Metrolink has purchased that whole area. So actually, Ontario Aboriginal Health, uh, sorry, Housing Services, OAHS, we've been talking to them. Right now, if they were to move forward on a new housing project, they could only make like 40 units. But if they wait a little bit longer and get a little more property from Metrolinx for that corner, they can make 108 units. So that's also part of the advocacy that we're doing. So every time I'm talking to a housing minister, I'm saying, hey, talk to Metrolinx because OAHS really wants a portion of that Metrolinx property. So that's in the works, it's coming. They want 108 units. So that's the quick and dirty update for you there. That is not my call. That is an OAHS call. I do not own, we do not have any purview over Ontario Aboriginal Housing Services. So that's something that you might have to talk to OAHS about. That's not something that I can do. Erin. I do have, I do have ward funds. I have asked engineering services to give me a list and one of those where I prioritized it. So I asked them, here are my funds. What can I do to be the most fiscally responsible and to get the most bang for my buck for this very little tiny pot of money that I have? And they're like, okay, counselor, we'll get back to you. I'm like, and talk to me about Cannon Street because put that in there somewhere. So I'm still waiting for that list to come back. But yes, I do have more discretionary. I have some more dollars that I can put towards it. I'm just wanting to work with engineering services to make sure that, A, it actually gets done. Because I really don't want them to say, good counselor, that's good, right? I want them to actually put it into their work plan. And I really want to see it come forward. So just waiting on those sort of things. Yes. So the question is, how does the tiny amount of dollars get split up between all of the different wards? There is a complicated formula that I do not understand. It has something to do with number of dwelling units, number of people, number of students, number of needs. Students is, a, is part of the calculation too. Um, so there is a very complicated formula and that's what we get. So unfortunately, I don't have a better answer for you. Sorry about that. Last question, because we're, we're coming up at nine o'clock. Yes, blue shirt. Oh, it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. Uh, Sobe bikes and the scooters are coming. Um, they are going to go all the way to Parkdale, I think, right? Sometime in this year. Parkdale? It's, no, it's going to go Kenilworth and beyond. Oh, scooters will go to Parkdale, but we'll get Sobe up to Kenilworth. Um, and a lot of that is they ask for money. So if we're tight now, they're going to ask for more money. So that might be a couple of years later down the line for Sobe. But the scooters will go because scooters are done by Bird, which is a totally different organization. They'll go all the way to Parkdale slash almost the Red Hill. Yeah, so that's coming. It's by the end of the year, I think. All right. So thank you, everyone. We are very close to nine o'clock. Uh, please eat some more um, and help me bring, don't bring the Roma pizza home because that would be too much Roma pizza. But thank you again. Thank you so much. <laughs>
More than double a council digits? meeting. Double digits, people. I know. What? How does she turn this off? End stream.